Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with Peter Finley, the filmmaker and the journalist, and uh, Jerry Diaz uh, from Unifor. Uh, we, we we talk about a new film. Well, we don't just talk about the new film, Company Town, but we talk about this film, this story, and we, we talk about the impact of that. We talk about the implications for uh, labor and uh, challenges to, to trade union movements. We talk about uh, as Jerry will say, but, you know, economic carnage. We talk about raw capital and 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 the integrity of 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 the workforce and what that actually means. And and the film company town is about GM and it's about the closing in in Oshawa, Ontario. We we talk about the 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 labor movement and those who are sympathetic to it and and those who aren't and and what 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 collective strength really is all about. This is a this is a film about. Um, to me, it's a film about resistance, as Peter will say. It's a film about continued resistance. I think is something that Peter talks about, and and about about pushing back, and about uh, not just being seen as a cog in a machine, but 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 be, being seen and being viewed as as you know as human beings, as people, as families, as communities, and and it's really interesting. Peter and I and Jerry talk about this you know, that, that, that sort of the negative connotations to the name on, uh, of company town, because they're there for sure. But at the same time, it's also something really quite uh, delightful and definitely rooted in relationship and community and, and quite beautiful in its own way. And, um, so, so, uh, listen in, uh, the film is going to be on CBC. It's going to exist there for a long time. I don't know about in perpetuity, but, but, uh, it's, it's there for you to see. It's called company town, um, and, and like I said, so many things we talk about this idea that capital has no conscience and, 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 and that it is a brand new day and, and, and what does the future hold? And you know what? Sting makes an appearance and, uh, as well. And, um, you'll remember this when, when you see the film and you listen to the interview, you'll, you, you will remember the, the headlines from, uh, not that long ago, uh, in, in Toronto. And I'm sure some of this resounded around the world. So stay tuned, uh, Jerry Diaz and, uh, Peter Finley coming up talking about company. Company Town. Don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my my writing and my speaking. And you can uh, order a copy of Real Changes Incremental there. I'd love it if you did that. And if you got to um, this interview through iTunes or Spotify or Amazon or one of the one of the usual suspects, please leave us a review if you've enjoyed what you've listened to today. A four or five star review. Um, a little comment goes a long long way for us. We're going to start a contest soon. Uh, hopeful. Um, uh, hopefully very soon to to drive people towards uh, leaving uh, a, a comments for us. It's really hard to get noticed, and that's one of the ways. You can click a, a like on YouTube. That'd help if you're listening there. Uh, but if you're on one of the other uh, platforms, please just leave us a quick review. And uh, if you don't know about face-to-facelive.ca, that's where all of these uh, interviews are hosted. So check us out there. Sign up for the newsletter. And we only send out six a year, but you can advertise in that as well. You can advertise on the, on the podcast itself, on the website. We're getting thousands of unique hits every month and so check us out and if you're looking for a new audience and a new way to get to word on the street please reach out to us there and uh, just as i wrap up here rabble.ca is a platform that i've i've existed on for for many years now and alongside of other journalists thinkers who are writing uh, about issues uh, that matter news for the rest of us so check out rabble as well uh, but in the meantime stay tuned and lean in and 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 listen uh, uh, just a little bit closer on this one company town peter finley jerry Di- uh, jerry Di is coming uh, right up well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a couple of very special guests here with us today. Uh, this is a this is an important uh, story to tell. This is uh, uh, we've got an important film on our hands that's going to be on uh, um, CBC in the very near future. The film is called Company Town. We have Jerry Dias and and Peter Finley here with us today to talk about the issues. They're going to talk about the film. And uh, hey, guys, thank you for joining me here today on Face to Face. Thanks for having us, David. Thank you. 
So, you know, Peter, director of the film, why don't why don't you right out of the gate give us a little bit of context, give the listeners I've watched the film by the way, congratulations. Always hard to watch these kinds of stories to be honest with you. I mean, the, you know, I don't know that it, can we say it's a hopeful film? I'm going to let you say that, but but congrats and it's and again, it's one of those important pieces of documentary filmmaking that people need to see and and tell give us some context, Peter. Well, um, I was working um, as an instructor at Durham College. Um, I'd been involved in film, obviously, for three decades now. Um, and I'd, I'd done a lot of stories over the years. Um, actually, when I was back at the CBC on international trade, I've always been uh, uh, sympathetic and supportive of the labor movement. And when I was teaching at um, Durham, I'd be driving along the 401 and I'd sort of cast a glance over at the, the, the big GM factory and wonder, you know, what was going on there at any given moment over the years, because I was mm. doing this for three years. And then, of course, like many Canadians, uh, I heard this, you know, stunning news that uh, the plant was going to be, you know, completely shut down after 100 years of continuous production. And I thought, my God, that that's that's a piece of labor history and, and, and community history for the entire you know, region of Durham and specifically for Oshawa. And I thought, you know, there's, there's a, there's a film there. There's a, there's stories there that are just going to disappear. Um, if somebody doesn't sort of make an effort to really, uh, do, you know, take a, a serious look at it. There's a lot of spot coverage of these kinds of things when they happen in the mainstream media. But, um, I think it's fair to say the last really big labor film that I'm can think of. I know there's been a few in between, but the, the big one was the final offer, which was, uh, I believe that was 1984. Jerry would actually know that, but that was really the ascendancy of the CAW, the peak, I think mm. back when there were 23,000 employees, uh, in the plant on the line. And at the point that I entered, uh, the story, they were looking at being reduced down to zero. Right. So that's a pretty compelling, uh, narrative arc <laughs> to explore as a filmmaker. Jerry, Jerry, what do you, what do you, you know, we, you know, we, we're not going to probably talk too much, I suppose, about the uh, actual film itself. You know, there's, te- there's, there's teaser trailer out there and so on, but we're happy to do whatever, wherever we want to go. But what, what do you, how do you feel after having seen the film? You know, to, to Peter's point, there's so many stories there. I love the phrase, by the way, spot coverage, Peter. It just sounds, George Orwell would have liked that, I think, mm-hmm. you know, like, because we're really not focusing on what matters, right? Jerry, can can you talk a bit about that, that importance of, because there's four or five families, essentially, that are followed in the film, and, and we get to see how, we get to empathize with them and see how this really does impact real people. Well, that's, look, the story has to be told. I mean, there's mm. decisions made by raw capital that have not just negative impacts on individuals or individual families, but on, on entire communities. And so, look, it was it was our union fighting fighting General Motors, and General Motors is a large, one of the largest, most powerful global companies in the world, um, and you know, up until the pandemic hit, we're making billions and billions of dollars a year in profit. So when GM makes a decision, it's pretty tough to get them to change their mind. So we gave it our all. We ran Super Bowl ads. We Mm -hmm. ran ads during, you know, Leaf game, Raptor games, playoff games. We ran ads during the, you know, Golden Globes, Academy Awards. We wildcatted the plant we did everything under the sun we had wildcats in the supply base we did everything to get gm's attention at the end of the day we got a, a, a basically a stay of execution um but we ran out of time i mean the the problem with oakville is there's no question in my mind gm was planning on 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 leaving oshawa for years um and then in 2016 we bargained a, a pickup truck uh, which we thought would be lead to, to others. And then, of course, we had the announcement in November of 2018 that they were closing at the end of 2019. So, you know, all hell broke loose. But it's important that, you know, that viewers see the carnage, the economic harm mm. that it causes. So, look, um, the, the the film is critical. Some of our members are critical at our union, critical at me. And they have the right to be because, look, my objective was to get GM to put in another vehicle in the plant to stop the carnage, and we weren't successful. 
So mem- members have the right to be mad, but you know, I would suggest at the end of the day, if the, the real focus of anger should be on the company that made the decision, not on the union that fought like hell to change their mind. Peter, you made, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know who your editor was, or maybe you were editor, but I'm sure you were looking over their shoulder in, 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 signif- in a variety of different ways. But you left, a, you left a line in, and I'd love for both you and Jerry to comment on this, but somebody said, you know, uh, most people are doing, or sorry, most people are putting up the white flag and moving on. Mm-hmm. That, that's really interesting to me. And is, was that put in as a hopeful comment? Was it put in as a cynical comment to say, there's just, you know, we can't, we can't fight the big, the big man yeah. and woman upstairs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I would say neither. I would say that it was left in there to show that how big the challenges are that are facing the current uh, trade union movement. I mean, back when Jerry was coming up through the ranks, I mean, I think actually the line that precedes that is that, you know, if something happened in the plant back in the old days, they'd shut it down overnight. Right. That, that's a lot yes. more difficult to do when you're looking at globalization and mm. uh, the mobility of capital, as Jerry was saying, where a company can leave in the middle of the night, you know? Um, right. The, 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 the clout that uh, the trade union movement can bring has been severely, uh, uh, you know, curtailed by the the nature of you know trade agreements and and forces that are well beyond you know any individual actions that a worker can take on the plant floor now i mean where the power of the trade union movement lies today and where it's always lied is in the collective strength of the membership and uh, i mean jerry's keenly aware of that and that's his job is to rally uh, the membership and I, I think you see that in the film that uh, as jerry said he's trying to leverage every possible weapon he's got in his arsenal. But at the end of the day, he's still up against a, a, a corporation that has made a decision in a boardroom, you know, 500 kilometers away to leave. And there's not a lot you can do to get them to reverse a position like that, especially when, you know, the bottom line is really what's driving the, the whole agenda. There's no, uh, you know, the, the arguments that we would make as Canadians and as members of the uh, Oshawa community, I wouldn't say they fall on deaf ears with GM completely, but um, that is not their priority. Mm-hmm. Well, the interesting thing is the amount of balls that were up in the air that, well, from our point of view, so let me give you an example. First, we deal with the announcement from General Motors, and then it doesn't only impact our members that work for General Motors, but all the suppliers as well. And so we're trying to negotiate. First of all, we're trying to get GM to change their mind. And every time that GM, we would hit GM, we would do something, we'd have commercials, we'd have demonstrations, we shut down their corporate headquarters. GM would keep coming back, emphasizing, look, we're not changing our mind. So every time they said to the press, we're not changing our mind, we're not changing our mind. It was almost like another dagger in the hopes for our members. And so look, at, at one point, there's no question. I mean, Greg Moffat was the chairperson of the Oshawa complex. He said, look, our members just want to get on. They just, you know, they want us to negotiate the severance packages. They want to just move mm. on because they don't think that the company is going to change their mind. And so regard, so you had the, the local was saying, look, they're under tremendous pressure uh, to, to let's see what type of packages we can bargain. And we're still hammering away knowing that we had to find a solution for the Oshawa plant because we knew that our members that worked for the suppliers wouldn't get any type of money like that. So sure that the deal was carved with General Motors where the severance packages were enormous. The early retirement incentive packages were enormous. And then the willingness for our members in Oshawa that worked exactly for GM, like they didn't want a wildcat. They didn't want to take any more workplace actions. They just wanted to, you know, reluctantly accept that the plant was closing and take the mm-hmm. right. And, you know, many, so many others were now moving into retirement. So then we were left fighting with the suppliers that all banded together that said, all we're going to give is the minimum employment standards. We're not going to do anything more. So we had to pick them off one at a time. And of course, we ended up negotiating our good closure agreements with all of the suppliers, but it was a dog's breakfast. So, you know, as 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 the local bargaining committee in Oshawa is carving a deal uh, you know, that will benefit their members, it creates more difficulty uh, for our members at the supply base. And then the other side of it is I know this industry. 
I actually used to work in the GM van plant uh, back in the 80s. And then so obviously doing my job, I understand the industry incredibly well. And one thing that I do know, cars don't fall out of the sky. Mm. And so for us to try to get another vehicle in Oshawa uh, was, was an uphill battle, to say the least. And so, but we need it. We needed a vehicle. We needed it quickly so that our members, especially in the supply base, would have some hope. So that's why we fought, you know, so diligently. And like, look, there, there's a there's a, a person in the film um, who works for Siva Logistics that says, look, I got no, you know, he, he came right out and said, look, I got no faith in Jerry Dias. Well, you know, I'm sorry he felt that way. It's not from a lack of effort. But the reality is, is he was frustrated because we carved the deal to preserve 300 jobs because we're transitioning the plant to building parts. But the key piece is the deal was not just was was not the 300 jobs uh, that we kept. The key part of the deal was that we maintained the integrity of the plant. We kept the ability to build cars. And so here I'm going to be heading into bargaining with General Motors in a few weeks. And hopefully we're, we're going to find some sort of a solution. Hopefully we're going to find more jobs. Hopefully we're going to find a solution for Oshawa. But the key thing was the biggest thing that we got in the agreement in 2019 was maintaining the integrity of the plant. That paint shop in Oshawa is probably worth about three quarters of a billion dollars. So, you know, so there was a lot of frustration and I understand that and they have the right to be frustrated. But ultimately we were fighting an uphill battle right from the beginning. I think everybody realized that. Um, and look, there was a, it would have been helpful at the time when, when GM made the announcement, the premier, Doug Ford at the time, came right out and said, look, nothing can be done. The ship has sailed. I spoke to the president of GM Canada, and he says that they're not changing their mind. So Jerry Dias is creating false hope, and Jerry Dias is creating false exit. This is the premier, threw in the towel mm-hmm. right off the bat. And so here we're fighting like hell, and we've got the premier, in essence, joining with General Motors to say the ship has sailed. So it was a heck of a battle that we put up, but it's not over yet. I mean, look, we're going to be in bargaining with General Motors and, you know, there's there's still a lot of frustration. Now, like I, I took this whole thing personally and I and I say it and I said it right there. Look, my family lives in Oshawa. My mother's buried in Oshawa. My father's 91. He lives in Oshawa. This is personal to me. So, you know, you, you do the best you can. You, you don't fold. Uh, but ultimately... Look, a lot of people wanted to move on with their lives. They gave it the best shot they could. But people were also afraid of working right in General Motors that if they, you know, if they kept wildcatting, would GM fire them? Uh, Some of our members in the supply base were nervous. Listen, I need a severance package. If this is going down, just like I'm not going to risk getting a severance. I'm not going to risk getting fired. So there was all of this stuff going on in people's minds but and and, and in people's hearts because it's a tough time. So the story is critical. Of General Motors, it's critical of me, it's critical of our union. It shows that we're fighting, but the bottom line is it's a story that has to be told because it's about raw capitalism, it's about decisions made. To, you know, where you know they, they announced the GM announced the closure of Oshawa and plants in the US, but didn't impact not one of their Mexican operations. Why? Because they made they pay their Mexican employees, and it's not just GM, GM, Ford, Chrysler, Honda, Toyota, Daimler, you can walk BMW, all of them that have Mexican plants, they pay their workers a couple bucks an hour. So it's about maximizing your investment. It's about greed. So anyway, Jerry, you know, it's a story that has to be told. I, I, you're absolutely right, and I—I I mean, I—I I don't know if you the, the the new corporation is the sort of this the what's the subtitle? Help me out here, Peter. Oh, yeah, see, um, the unfortunate necessary like sequel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I highly recommend it to both of you. I interviewed Joel and Jennifer, the the co-directors of it, a few weeks back, and yeah, Jerry, you've talked about raw capital, and Peter step in here as well. I mean, is is this really about greed? Is it about greed for a small group of people? Is is that sort of how you see that? I mean, you know, a hundred years, this is a, you know, in a way you could kind of say, wow, that's, that's quite a legacy. It's, it's time to close our doors. Right. But, but, but maybe just maybe had we done th- things differently, had we been more aware, et cetera, et cetera, we could have, con- like, like you say, the paint plant, we've, we've managed to maintain the integrity of that. That that's, that's a win by the sounds of it. Right. So, so, so yeah, is, is this just about a small group of people who want more? 
Well, let well, me jump in here. I know Jerry's going to have lots to say about it, but from my perspective, I wouldn't personalize it in that way. I mean, this is a monolithic multinational corporation, and their only allegiance is to their shareholders. And that's not a moral position that they're taking. That is just the way they operate. So when it comes to them making decisions that affect the community of Oshawa or Lordstown or Detroit or wherever it may be, the calculus is it's, it, it doesn't operate on, a, on a, a scale that's recognizable to us, you know, as, you know, members of this of society. We, we, uh, the workers in Oshawa are um, uh, basically cogs in a machine uh, and, and, and their labor can easily be replaced by labor in the Maquiadora zone in, in Mexico at, I don't even know what, 10 percent of the rate that the Canadian workers uh, work for. So that's what they're looking at. Uh, the fact that the plant in Oshawa was an award-winning plant that was always extremely productive and highly uh, re- rewarded for uh, excellence really didn't factor in too much in the end of the day. Uh, it did over the years, but but when it came down to it, it was a, just a you know a, a cost and and benefit ledger that I think uh, GM looked was looking at. That's my perspective, anyways. Look, there's no question. It's all about, uh, it, in, it's about the return to uh, to shareholders. It's about it's about the corporate structure, no question. Um, but decisions are made. It's all about profits, so it's it's all intertwined. Now, one thing that is interesting is that, you know, all, many may like take a look and say, "Well, it was a hell of a fight," but you know, you only saved a handful of jobs, so it was deemed a failure. Mm. And to a large extent, look, we're not building cars anymore. So did Jerry Dias fail? The answer is yes, um, because the objective was to was to keep manufacturing vehicles. But it was not a failure insofar as I just ratified a deal today with Ford Motor Company, where we had no product in Ford and Oakville beyond 2024. And so we ended up getting about $1.8 billion worth of investment that's going into to uh, to Oakville um, to change the plant from internal combustible engines to battery uh, battery electric wow. vehicles. Wow, that's one a huge win. That Ford, one of the things that Ford said as I was bargaining with Ford is they said, look, we want no part, no part of what your organization did to General Motors when they announced the closure in Oshawa. So we're going to find a solution here. We don't want to be. We, 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 don't, we, we do not want that type of reaction uh, from your union. And frankly, that type of reaction from Canadian consumers. Um, prior to the announcement um, in November of 2018, uh, GM had led all sales in Canada for several years. Um, after they made their sale, they at one point had dropped to number four in Canada in sales. Um, four today is number one. That's all as a result of the fact that Canadians punished General Motors uh, based on the decision that they made in Oshawa. But so Ford was cognizant of it. So the fight back that we um, had you know, with uh, with General Motors back in 2018 and 2019, it may not have reversed General Motors' decision, but it sure played a role in Ford's. Jerry, you talk about in the film, uh, you, and, and again, either of you step in, but you talk about, uh, you know, February 14th, Valentine's Day, nicely done, I think, was the, the, the aggressive campaign was going to start. I mean, you guys were in the business of public engagement, right? This, But, but this was about membership. This was about executives, getting people to listen, getting to be, the advertisements, et cetera, et cetera. Were you also hoping that others, other unions, other other Canadians would step on board? Journalists would start writing about it. Peter cer- certainly came on board. And was that part of it as well, that, that, that there was this hope and desire that that we could create a groundswell to say, no, this, this labor movement is worth saving? Oh, there's no question. Um, there was a lot of moving parts in uh, during this whole fight, and there were a lot of unions showing support, and there was a lot of citizens in 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 the community of Oshawa that were walking with us. We had demonstrations on the bridges. We had mm. look, there was a lot of work going on. There was a sign campaign. We were banging signs on the lawns of the community of Oshawa, saying "Save GM Oshawa." We had look, it was a major, major campaign, and there's no question we spent millions of dollars to get GM's attention. To, to frankly uh, try to get them to reverse the decision. So, look, 
you, you, you do the best you can and you play the cards that you're dealt. Uh, but we gave it one heck of a go. And like I, frankly, if there's a way of doing anything differently, I really can't think of a different way of doing it. I mean, ultimately, are people going to be upset? Yes. Are people going to be mad at me personally because uh, GM didn't change their mind? The answer is yes. And, and that's all fair game. But I look, my conscience is clean. I gave it a good run. I gave it everything I had, frankly. Like I can't think of any union ever that or, or that ever would even think of running an ad during a Super Bowl. We spent money and ran an ad during the Super Bowl, the number one viewed, you know, sporting event in North America. You know, it's the first Sunday of February, every February. So anyway, so we like I said, I we didn't leave anything in the tank. Let's let's put it that way. I mean, my my perspective on it as an outsider to the uh, labor movement is how much damage has been done uh, to the cause of organized labor over the last 40 years because of these trade deals and the, you know, neoliberalism where, you know, as I was saying, and I don't want to hit it too hard, but I, I think it's a reality. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a sort of a conventional wisdom now that um, organized labor, these guys are, not everyone believes this, but there is there is a, a school of thought out there that organized labor makes too much money. They're they're not competitive. They're they're whiners. They're entitled. I mean, I obviously don't feel that way. I'm a, a, a strong supporter of organized labor, but I, I think it's fair to say that Jerry is up against that kind of attitude a fair amount. I mean, I, I remember traveling around in the car with you, Jerry, at one point, and you were you were looking at your BlackBerry and scrolling through all the nasty messages you were getting every morning from, you know, some kind of, you know, anti-labor uh, wingnuts. And um, I think that's very different than what it was like when you were coming up through the ranks, if I'm not wrong. Well, you know, what? The, what's interesting is that the labor movement in Canada is in much better shape than it is in the United States. I mean, Unionization in Canada is still sitting at about 30%. It's about 16% in the private sector and about 30% overall. In the United States, it's in single digits. Um, but there's no question. There's these misperceptions about, about union leaders, about unions in general, about members. And I mean, it's just sheer nonsense. I mean, ultimately, if you give working class people you know, the opportunity and you ask them, would you rather belong to a union or be non-union? Most people would rather belong to a union. The problem is, is all the intimidation um, and the firings and everything that happens as you're trying to organize. So look, the, the labor movement frequently gets bad rap, but look, the right has a lot more money than we do. I mean, if I take a look at the bots and the trolls that follow me each and every day, it's unbelievable. I mean, you got a bunch of keyboard warriors that I think are living in mummy's basement and get paid by the right in order just to just to throw nonsense. So, but I but I don't let it bother me to be honest with you. I don't like you see it. You can't you can't get knocked off track. I mean, if you if you if you if you really took to heart the negativity from those that inherently dislike labor, dislike um, uh, you know our vision, then. You know, you'll never accomplish anything. So you just can't get sidetracked with that type of negativity. It'll never do anything. Uh, David, you asked me earlier sort of what the context for this film was. And if, if there's a theme that came through in my experience of making the film over the last year and a half, it's that um, it's one of resistance, you know, mm. and the need for continued resistance because uh, the odds are, 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 are stacked in some cases, certainly in Oshawa they were. Uh, people are uh, struggling to deal with their own personal circumstances, the loss of jobs, in some cases, the loss of their homes even. We have one guy in the film who ends up in a trailer at the age of 55. That's not something that uh, most people would want to experience. And I think he, Peter, I think he in, he, he invented a new drink, didn't he? Yeah, whiskey, yeah. The, a whiskey slushy. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, so I think it's really important for those stories of resistance to be uh, documented and mm. celebrated, even if they end up in uh, setbacks. And, you know, I, I think you asked me at the beginning if I thought that the film was optimistic or, you know, how I would characterize mm -hmm. it. And I would say, yeah, it is optimistic because at the very end of the film, and I, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, be a, give away the ending, but um, – it's not entirely bleak from my perspective. Uh, you know, Jerry talks at the very end of the film about, it's, interestingly, about bargaining in 2020. And lo and behold, he's just uh, nailed down a deal that's going to see the um, 
production of five electric vehicles in Oakville. So that doesn't necessarily help the workers in Oshawa, but it tells you that the struggle continues. And I think everybody in the film would share that view, regardless of whether or not they're pro or con Jerry Dias or pro or con Unifor. These, everyone who was in the film were, they're all uh, trade union activists and they share that, uh, that view that you just you have to the, the struggle just continues no it's it's interesting because the like it looks many of the many of the um people who are in the film like some of them i used to work with i mean sam gidnam is in the film um who was a research director under the old uaw uh uaw canada and then the old caw but i mean it's it's interesting when you listen and you follow the narratives because, you know, it's much more difficult to, to lead in 2020 and to bargain in the auto industry because things have changed so much from when Sam was around. I mean, when Sam would bargain and when Sam was around, the Detroit three had about 95 percent of the North American market. So they weren't going anywhere. It's not like you had platforms that you could build two, three different vehicles on. It's not like. You know, GM could just slow down production at our Cami plant in Ingersoll and ramp up the production on the two assembly lines that they have in Mexico that build the exact same Equinox. I mean, 2020 is nothing like the the, the, the good old glory days where, you know, you had incredible, incredible power. So it's, a, it's that type of narrative to me that gets lost, that people don't see that the world has actually changed. You have global platforms today that never existed. The industry is so different today. And you're right, Peter, I talked about trade deals earlier on. I mean, if you take a look, Harper was a disaster. He couldn't bargain himself out of a wet paper bag. I take a look at CETA. I take a look at the free trade deal with Korea. I mean, the conservatives, frankly, bargained the original NAFTA. I mean, the trade deals have, 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 have taken about a half a million uh, jobs uh, related to the auto industry from the province of Ontario. So if you start to throw in the terrible trade deals, you know, the, the globalization of the industry, global platforms. I mean, the mass, uh, you know, entrance of, of sales of Korean vehicles, Japanese vehicles, the unfettered access to our markets, it's changed everything. But if you listen to, uh, if you listen to some people, I ideally, what they're saying sounds incredible, but the practical reality of it is it's, it was good back in the 70s, doesn't work that great in the, in the 2020s. So here lies the problem. Peter, I love I, I love how you say hey, Jerry. I, I don't think you're quite passionate enough about the topic. By the way, <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I I love that it comes out in the film and it comes out in the conversation. And and isn't that too, Peter? I mean, like any great film, any great story, there's so many layers, and I, I see that. And that that I love how you talk about uh, the continue. What was your phrase? Continued resistance. Yeah. And and what a perfect time to be talking about that on so many levels. For you know, for so many different communities, yeah. right? No, and, I think that and, the COVID, in in a uh, kind of a perverse way, has brought into high relief uh, the fragility of employment and community and and life in general for everybody, right? So I'm hoping that this film will resonate in a way that it might not have quite as much pre-COVID, because they'll say that you know, for you know, but for the grace of God, could be me losing my job for forces beyond my control. And uh, in moments like that, you know, you count your lucky stars that you're a member of a powerful organization that, you know, fights for its members, whether you agree with the leadership or not, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, no man is an island. I want to I want to I, I talk about a line that comes out around the midway through the film, and maybe that's going to be a good way to, to, to wrap things up in a couple of minutes. But I do want to talk about something. I think, Jerry, you said something about, I think it was you, Jerry, anyway, in the film where you talked about, you know, the practice versus the theory. I've studied philosophy now for 35 years of my life, and it's all about, you know, you got these high level sort of ideas if you can call them that or, or obtuse ideas maybe depending on who you ask and then you go well how do we actually take that on paper and make it a practical reality is is this just the way it is i mean is this like you know capitalism you know it's about making money right i mean this isn't that what this is all about and what the west is built on etc and and i think what i see with your film peter is 
in this resistance, in in the passionate commitment of uh, of, of Jerry and of others and members and, and the pushback, I see a, a, a longing for something else and something other. So maybe, hey, let's make as much money as we can, but let's treat people with you know honor and respect and value them in 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 very specific meaningful ways and and not let them wind up feeling betrayed i mean okay now i'm sounding like a hopeful idealist but 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 yeah anyway so, so there you how, go jerry but that's how you would want it to be yeah and exactly. that's how you would hope it would be but the facts are is that capital has no conscience mm. i mean when i talk about you know like i'm not in a situation where i can be an idealist. I got to be practical. I got to find solutions. Like I can't live in this fantasy land of which, geez, this is going to happen. Well, it's not. I mean, for example, I mean, the argument was that, look, we have to get the Trudeau government to buy the plant. Right. Well, the simple reality is Trudeau government's not buying the plant. They're not in the auto industry. So they give money like they're giving Ford Motor Company to build battery electric vehicles. Yes, they have to do that. I mean, this argument that, look, we're going to turn GM into a battery electric vehicle operation. The government should buy it and trans transform it. Well, there's no question later on down the road, the solution for that plant may very well be green. But the facts are is that that wasn't the solution a year ago. I needed a pickup truck or I needed a car. I needed something to get into that plant to extend it until we could figure out a long term solution. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking to GM about. And it may be about, OK. How long will it take? Um, can we get an electric vehicle? Can we get a pickup truck? Can we get a car? Can we get a crossover? Can we get anything? Because we have to you know, get something into that plant to make sure that the paint shop doesn't rot while we talk about a longer term vision. So mm. like, so those that say, listen, the government should just be by the plant and turn it into a, uh, you know, turn it into a green plant. It sounds fabulous. And I wish it was true. Right. But I think the practical reality and the odds of that happening are less than zero. So I can't spend a ton of effort on something that I know is about zero percent or less. So I have to try to find solutions as difficult as they are. And that's why sometimes I get frustrated with those that have fabulous ideas. Um, but frankly, their ideas aren't going anywhere. And, they, you know, it's 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 interesting. You never should give up hope and you always have to fight. And I get all that. But look, you have to see where you have a legitimate chance mm. of, of making some inroads and concentrating your effort there. And they, people don't like it, but I say, listen, I don't, I don't chase mice when I'm hunting elephants. And, and that, that's the way it is. I mean, you can't, you can't get sidetracked um, and, and go down, go down the wrong path. You'll never find any success. Uh, David, I would just uh, jump in here and say that um, when I first approached Jerry with the idea of doing a film, you know, I told him, I said, look at, you know, I'm kind of entering this story right near the end, uh, in a sense, in the sense that the, pl the plant closure was imminent. And I said, look, at, I can't tell this story without, you know, exploring, you know, warts and all, you know, because there's obviously right. built-in conflict in, in this dynamic. And I, I think that's what the fil film reflects, is that uh, Unifor was extremely open in allowing me access. I mean, it, if it hadn't been for Jerry's intervention on, on behalf of the project, it wouldn't have happened. Um, the members, the rank and file members were incredibly generous with their time. Um, you, you know, the local was fantastic. Uh, for me personally, it was a really, um, significant experience and I, I was honored to be able to try to tell their story. And, uh, you know, my hope is that at the end of the day, and I'm, I believe there is the capacity within the organization to continue to have these debates and to continue, as I said, to resist and, and move forward. And that, you know, I, I hope the film, uh, makes that clear because I it was it was in no way meant to be a film that was a uh, you know the at one point the working title was the end of the line and mm. I, I scrubbed that because I just thought it was a little bit too negative right um, company town arguably is a negative has negative connotations as well but the, the thinking there was just that it was a, a community steeped in the tradition of auto building um, and uh, you can see that evidenced in the film. Well, I think it also speaks just to 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 the real lives of this company town. Mm -hmm. These are these are people who are making their lunches every morning at six a.m. to go there. I mean, I think of as a kid driving to way out east, you know, whatever three four times a year, living out in the West End, grew up in Rexdale, and and passing that plant and the size of it, and you know, I didn't know at that age, you know, the hundred year tradition. I mean, it just it's it, 
yeah, this is a part of who we are. So I don't, I don't see anything negative in the name at all, Peter, if, yeah. uh, for, uh, for it, what it, that's worth. It was, certainly <laughs> wasn't intended. I mean, I, 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 like you, I was, you know, pretty uh, powerfully moved by learning about their stories and, mm. and trying to, you know, give them a, a forum for that. So I, I, I'm glad that well, everybody that I worked with, you know, rose to the occasion and gave me the space to, you know, to, to tell their stories, Jerry included, you know, there's that scene with his, his family that's um, yeah, yeah. pretty powerful. So the real question is, as we wrap up, did Sting ask either of you for your autographs? <laughs> uh, actually, him and I were emailing each other just a couple of days ago. Um, I sent him the highlights of the Ford agreement and he emailed me back um, and he ended his comments in brackets. He said, still out of work. I had a good shot because he's living in his, you know, in his vineyard in Italy, right? <laughs> anyway, it was still out of work, he said. It was just hilarious. I mean, he's he's a decent man. He uh, he did a lot. Uh, yeah. He did a lot to... Uh, well, that uh, must have been a super, sh- super shot in the arm, too, you would think, right? Just from a um, yeah, community perspective. You know, right? the, you, you got it. The, you know what the difference was? Just here was a guy that arguably had no skin in the game that stuck his nose in to fight mm. with us to try to find a solution that you had all of these politicians that had all kinds of skin in the game and didn't lift a finger. And so that, that to me speaks volumes about the, the Sting's character. I got very close to him. And like I said, we still keep in touch and uh, he's a, uh, he's a working class. He's, he understands working class politics. He understands working class people. He understands struggle and uh, he's just a decent band. And what he didn't have to stick his nose in. He did. And he only did it because he thought it was the right thing to do. Well, yeah, powerful, I, powerful I, use of celebrity. Eh? I think that's. I, uh, I don't want to give Sting uh, too much of a plug here because Jerry's already been eloquent on him. But he, you know, one thing that is not maybe obvious in the film is he gave us the rights to two uh, tracks to use, which. If I was doing a feature film or a, a right. high budget film, would have cost more than the whole damn thing altogether. That's right. And I know Steve, enough about movie making to yeah, know how complicated. Steve basically, that just said, you know, make it, make it happen, make and it happen. that gave us what I think is a very stirring ending. Where I took the uh, the track called "Brand New Day" at the very end of the film. Yes. And uh, it speaks to you know. Uh, keep keep moving forward you know and uh, i wanted as i said to end on a a note that uh you know people will feel empowered by watching and and not feeling like you know that you're watching a um a funeral dirge so uh thanks to sting for that yeah well it's it's an amazing little shout out i think and i you know there was so many things obviously stick out for me and 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 i hope for many other canadians and others who ultimately get to see this as well because i really do think this is a a film about community it's a film about pushing back and about about new opportunities and and what the future holds and all of that which i think is just wonderful but one of the things for me peter jerry was this notion of a just transition and 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 just for i don't know is that the philosopher in me coming out but just there's so much buried in that right because it's about relationship it's about trust it's about justice it's about treating people fairly and kindly and respectfully and all that and i think the fact that we're talking about those things is a beautiful thing so i um yeah just thanks to you both for joining me today and and um i don't know if either of you have anything you want to wrap up with but just before we end anyone listening please please like us out there on youtube or yeah, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening today to, to and check out Face to Face Live for, for more interviews. But uh, Peter, Jerry, anything to wrap up uh, uh, as we as we come to a close here about our conversation today on Face to Face out in Company Town? Go ahead, Peter. Well, I, just as I to reiterate what I always said, already said, um, you know, I'm incredibly thankful to to uh, Unifor, both to uh, Jerry and his staff who were incredibly generous and, in, you know, making access possible for me for the rank and to the rank and file members who opened up their lives to, to, to the film crew. And, and just, it was a real privilege to be able to tell their stories. I mean, I remember we were filming some scene myself and my cameraman and uh, my cameraman turns to me and he goes quietly, just not to raise any attention by anyone. He said, you know what, we're, we're filming history here. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, I had a keen sense of that responsibility while making the film that, you know, uh, this is something that will, be remembered for a long time. Yeah. And I'm hoping that it's going to serve as a catalyst for, you know, better things and, and for uh, a continued, you know, vibrant labor movement in Canada. Cause I think we need it now as much or more than ever. Well, well, what a, yeah. Jerry, go. 
Yeah, my final comments are going to be for our members in Oshawa that work for General Motors and the supply, uh, the supply chain and the supply chain. Look, it was a uh, it was a tough time, and it is a tough time, and I I couldn't even imagine what people are going through today. Um, a full you know nine and a half months, almost ten months since the closure of the Oshawa complex. But the bottom line is uh, we haven't forgotten. We haven't forgotten what this decision has done to the community. And uh, it's not over. I think, we'll I, think you, there. I think your quote for, for, from you, Jerry, is we have a long memory. Or do I ever? <laughs> <laughs> we, we've, been, we've been chatting about Company Town with uh, Jerry Dias and Peter Finley here today on Face to Face. Thanks, Peter. Jerry, thank you so much for your time. Thank today. you, David. Thank you. Take care, David.